Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Journey of Becoming a Head Coach. As always, I'm your host, Jeff Freeman. Thank you again for all the love and subscribers and uh, all the comments that I've been getting. Thank you for the support. Today, we're going to go over the 3-4 defense. And uh, honestly, this is round two. Um, I had to get a different camera because the first camera I had died. So <laughs> this is going to be round two. I'm going to try to make sure I cover everything that I covered in the first one. Um, so ran the 3-4 defense for several years at a couple different locations. Um, I finally came up with a system that I really enjoyed, and I really enjoyed coaching. I enjoyed teaching. I felt like our players um, were successful, and they did a really good job. I'm sorry, I'm erasing that because I just noticed how small I was drawing that. So um, I noticed how well our players enjoyed it and how easy it was for them to understand and how much success we honestly had with it. So I'm going to cover just the basic fronts of it, the basic coverages we had out of it, and um, some of our, our routine blitzes and our numbering system that we had out of it. So the, our fronts, this is our base front. This was just cover two for us. Um, responsibilities, nose played zero. He was a zero gap defender and he played two gap. Now, if he wasn't strong enough to play that two gap position, we would slant him based on the team. If they were a tight end heavy team and that's where they ran, we would slant him there. If they were an inside zone team or they were a zone read team, sometimes we'd slam them away from the back or to the back. And then we would also, this made it really easy for us to cross key against inside zone. Stud was in a five. Quick was in a five. Stud is supposed to be the baddest run defender we got. He's able to set hands, sit, control the B gap, and a little bit of the C gap if we needed him to. Quick, he was pinching hard, and his job was to follow any pulling guard, any pulling tackle. Um, honestly, this defense worked really well because or the best it ever ran was when both these guys were just super athletic and quick. We had a track star here that would just be able to pinch and follow and he was tackling traps and sweeps back here because he was able just to see that guard pull. He would follow and he was making tackles back here and this tackle could not get to him. Especially when we started aligning him in different spots and playing games. Um, and you'll see based on that numbering system. Rover, we played games with them, and sometimes we would do where, depending on if he's in the boundary, we would put him in between, have him shuffle down and pinch. Uh, we inverted him sometimes, and this is what I called inverted. We would put him on the number one receiver, put the corner inside in case to help with any slant, and then as the quarterback started his cadence, he would get halfway and read the tackle. Tackle pass it, he would just sink back to help with any slant because the corner could get over the top of any kind of post, any corner, any seam. And then if that tackle down blocked, he was coming hard right to the back of the, uh, of the quarterback. So we would do that sometimes. I think we did that maybe a handful of times. But in any case, he lined up in what we call the seven. Our numbering system, again, 2i, 4i. Um, I didn't like that. Never have. Never didn't, Never liked it as a player. Didn't like it as a coach. Um, so I had seen another system and kind of copied it where no matter what on the center was a zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Our players seemed really receptive to that. And then as you'll see, I developed a, um, a tagging system where it told how these guys how to line up so we could adjust our blitzes and play games. So Rover primarily was in a seven tech, reading the tackle, had outside boot counter reverse. His job was to get heels depth and then shuffle down, shuffle down. He didn't pursue until that ball got across the line of scrimmage. Because I can't tell you how many times this guy would take off sometimes and these guys would do some kind of throwback or reverse and our rover's gone. So we had to work pursuit really hard where he would sit and wait for that to happen. So that was his job was boot counter reverse, BCR, whatever you want to call it, but he would sit, wait, and shuffle down. And we also had him shuffle down so then that way, in case of any counter, pulling guards, pulling tight ends. That was also how I taught pursuit to the D-line. So say that play goes away, he gets heels depth, shuffle, shuffle, 1,001, 1,002, ball's gone, pursue. That's kind of how I taught it, just to avoid. And it worked really well when every time someone tried to run a reverse or a counter, because he would shuffle down, shuffle down, and he could wrong arm that pulling guard, pulling tackle, and bounce it out to our rover. And to, our, and to our will, worked out really well. Will and Mike were in 20 techs. 
Heels were about four or five. It would kind of depend on the backer. If he was a fast backer, we'd put him at five, especially if he liked to get caught in the mess. If he was more of a slow bruiser, we'd move him up to four. Stud was in a nine. His job was to set hands and harass the tight end if they had one and shove him in condensed C-gap and set the edge. If he had widened out, we would play games just like we did with the rover. Sometimes we'd line him up, he'd come here. Other times, we might just actually line up the safety over the top and just line him up right in the center. Again, it kind of depended on the team, how good was that slot receiver, and how good was our sandbacker. If our sandbacker was all athletic as hell, we'd disco him down and then let him drop depending on what the tight end did. So again, same thing out of this though, he had, he had outside contain, especially if there was nobody there. So that was his job. Corners, we were in cover two. Um, we were primarily a cover two team, sometimes cover three, kind of depending on you know the scheme and whatnot. Um, goal line, similar to uh, last week, if you saw last week's video, I went over the bear front. Everybody just would condense. Uh, my philosophy was, yes, uh, defense is alignment, assignment, pursue, and execute, and all that good stuff, but I also was of the mindset of, if an offense condenses, we need to be able to react, and then align, assign, and execute. So whatever formation they came out in, we need to be able to either condense or widen. Condense or widen. We need to react to that formation, align properly, and then execute. So we would just bog down. Everybody would come on down, and we would bring the rover, the stud, corners would be six by two, and then these guys would walk up, obviously depending on the, um, depending on the down and distance, these two guys would come up, and then our free safety and strong safety would be right there. So that was the predication of it, and then sometimes, honestly, we would invert it again, and we would say, okay, no, Mike, you stay behind the nose, strong safety, you get up in that gap. Or we would bring the Sam down again. It all depended on personnel and what they wanted to do. We would do that as well. So it all kind of depended on how well this team reacted and what we could get away with. This is what I really liked against QB sneaks. If they weren't a QB sneak team and they were a dive team, then I would put the Will and the Mike right in here. The free safety and the strong safety would be sitting in the B gaps. And our um, stud would be sitting right there in that gap. So yeah, we do give up the edge a little bit for down blocks, but at the same time, the idea was, the premise was, if these guys sat hard, our strong safety should be able to come off, and free safety should come off the edge and really be able to sit hard and force that to cut back inside. And then we had corners for run help as well, depending on their baseline was six by two. And we were automatically in man. Um, we called it black. It was automatic, we were just in zero. Everyone was manned up, so. That was the predication, and that was the determination for that. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, coverages we ran two, three, four, seven, man free and man. Ran some twenty-one where we had two deep safeties and man underneath. Not very often. Also, we didn't run cover four very often. I wasn't very comfortable in teaching it and we didn't really have a need for it right out the gate. Um, the D-line numbering system. This one's going to be uh, fun for everybody. These are just the base numbers that I used um, the most, to be brutally honest. Um, and uh, just so that way you guys can kind of get an idea. Oh, I forgot about 52. <laughs> anyway, 52, and we played 52N sometimes, 53N. And uh, 55. So again, our numbering system: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These numbers I would use to tell these guys where to line up. It would go left to right. So if I call 53, left to right, especially if we're on the opposite end. And in fact, you know what? I'll do that to uh, help you guys out. So now we really see what I'm talking about with this. So from left to right. Say I called 53. So, again, if I called 53, then he's in a 5, he's in a 3. The nose would shade to the higher number. 
And the reason we would do this is, again, we would try to play games and open up gaps. So this worked really well to run that blitz. So we called it lasso, or we call it arrow, I think. Um, but it worked really well as a pass rush, especially against slide protection teams, because we get that tackle coming hard, and sometimes if we really got him to dig hard, the tailback would have to help, and the willy would come off. We could use it against backside runs. So again, 53, um, that was that base one. And obviously, again, if you just kind of take a look at the numbers, you can kind of see where we played around with people. So, and then if I wanted to tag it, so like I had a 53G. So if I did that, all that meant was 53G. I loved to do this and bring these two guys and bring like a blast or bring a, uh, an X stunt. So if I call 53 blast, the Q is there, but he's going here, he's coming B gap, He's attacking the C, and now we're bringing, worked really well against inside zone, worked really well against the veer to stop the veer and force them to bounce out, because now that option is bouncing out, he's got QB, he's got QB, and then our safety and corner have pitch. So it really forced a lot of things to screw up the veer on that. And then again, too, if they were a, a wing T team, I mean, again, wing T is just a whole other different animal. But it helped us, again, covering up the guards. It made it hard for them to pull. Um, and then we would play games and blitz on the tackle and play games with that. Um, and then the opposite, I would have like a, a 53N. All that would mean is just the opposite. So, for example, if I call the 53N, then the nose would just stay there. So, again, we got a 5, we got a 3, we got a nose. And I'm sorry, I drew him in like a 51G. Still can run that. But 53G would more look would look more like this if I ran a 53G, really opening up those A gaps for my Mike and Will. So again, the numbering system I'll rewrite it just so again if you guys didn't get a chance to get it. I mean I know you know this is a video so you do have a chance to go back. But again, these were the primary ones that I used. You can play games as much um, as you want. 53, 53G, 53N, and 55. And I mean, you could attach the G and the N to any of these, really. If you wanted to run, you know, a 43, again, these are things that I didn't really have to do, nor did I really want to do, but you could run a 43G, and you could have that look. You got a 4, you got a 3, you got a, and you got a G. You got him over the guard. You got a 4, you got a 3, you got a G. You can do that. You can play games with that. Um, the only problem with that is it depends on the blitz you're bringing because now you got two guys that might be wanting to go B-gap, especially if you're bringing a blast. Now, you could do that where he's slanting across his face, which is fine. Um, again, something I never ran. These were the primary ones I ran. And it was just things that the kids knew, and we just did one by one by one by one by one. We started here, and we worked our way. This was obviously our goal line for the most part. Um, Obviously, 22 would be our actual goal line because we're head up over the guards. But we got all the way down to here. I think the last one I put in was like a 31. And to be quite honest with you, I don't really remember why. It was a very special reason I put that in. Uh, didn't use it very often. But 33 through 55, that was the primary ones we used. And just bringing different blitzes, giving the offensive line, especially man scheme, if offensive linemen are thinking, then we're winning the battle because they have to spend time thinking, locating guys, and then really, when you really want to mess with them, um, as, an, as a former offensive lineman, movement always sucked. So, I mean, we would go 55, and then depending on what they were doing, depending on how they lined up, whatever they want to do, if they were one of those spread teams and they waited and they looked and then they got set, we would predicate certain things be like, okay, Start off in 55, shift to a 53. So then when they saw everybody get set, it would shift to a 53. So now the line's like, okay, wait, he was head up, he was head up, but now they're in the gap, so still gap down backer, or switch to a 53G, and he's got to shift all the way over here. Now it's like, well, wait, we were supposed to double team the nose, now there's no nose, but now i got a Q here. Again, making the O-line think, checking their rules, 
And meanwhile, the quarterback's going along with his cadence and everything's all good and dandy. So, little games like that we really enjoyed playing. D-line stunts, um, we would have several, and again, this was another reason to run this system. So, for example, a, a 35 axe, so left to right, a 35 axe. So, we would bring him, there's the three, there's the five. So again, a 35 axe tells the nose we're going strong side. He's pinching hard and going through. And then we're bringing the S on through on that front. That's a 35 axe. Nose goes first, getting on the way through to B. And then our stud comes through on the back side. And we would bring Mike or Will. We would bring stud or Sam or the rover on that as well. We could if we needed to. And then another one would be like a 53 skin. And that would be our stud going first. So if we brought a 53 skin a little bit closer, and now he's getting through to the A, and he's looping around to the B or the C. So that was single man stunts. If we went to the other side, it would be something similar to pick. So if we wanted to go to the other side, and let's just say we wanted to run a 35G. We'll just put, we'll throw that out there. Again, I don't think I ever ran it, but let's just say a 35G. We got a three, we got a five, we got a G. A 35G and we call um, pick. He's going hard through the B, he's coming hard through the A. And then, you know, say we want to run a 52N, okay, 52N. Something we did run, and this one I did run out of this. A 52N quiz. You got a 5, you got a 2, you got an N, you run a quiz. Q, our quick goes first, nose goes second. Little games. Little games like that to confuse the offense. And it's really easy for the defense to line up and have confidence in what they're doing. So, three-man stunts again. This is one very similar. If you guys watched the last video, the bare front video, um, I did those loop games, <laughs> and uh, I really enjoyed them. And I could run them with these two guys, or depending on if we wanted to go nickel and we wanted to do like a true four-man front, I could run it with the stud or the Sam or the Rover. But for example, if I wanted to run a 55 stun, um, then what would happen is everyone's going to loop or everyone's going to come hard. And usually, I would bring him off the edge as well to really force this. But he's coming hard through the A. He's going hard through the B. He's coming off the edge to force the QB to bail, and he's looping all the way around, and he's dropping. A four-man stunt, setting the edge, forcing the QB to go to his side that he doesn't want to go to, and we're bringing one of our faster defensive ends all the way across. Again, stole this from the Colts, watched the film over and over with Dwight Freeney, watching them doing this, and just watching it and diagramming it like, okay, and then we could play games with it again. You could... 55 was hard to do, to be quite honest, and we only did it out of 55 because I had those track stars at defensive end at the time. These two guys were cross-country runners, and for whatever reason, they were just fast, athletic, and mean, and they were able to get across really well. When I had slower guys, obviously, I would adjust him and do similar to something like a, uh, like a 34. So I would bring him into the three, the nose would be here, and my cue would be in like a four technique. So in that way, it gets them still in the same arena, but gives him a shorter route to get around. So that was kind of that front. Um, if I wanted to run it, again, with the rover, or for example, with the stud here, um, it would be like a nickel. So we would call like a nickel stun or loop. Um, so if we want to do it that way, again, we would bring these guys hard, 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 and then loop him all the way around right outside. If we want to run like a 55 loop in nickel. So he would be like a true defensive end, and obviously we would adjust these guys depending on, they probably wouldn't be in this 43 stunt. They'd probably be more in like a 53, more like this kind of stunt look right here. So that way it looks more um, accustomed to a four man front. So that's kind of the games we would play um, as far as our front's concerned. Um, coverages, again, cover two, cover three. Cover two, we would always bring one guy. 
cover three and man free we would bring two so um, for a prime example so if we're bringing and again it's just roll 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 if we're bringing the rover and it's cover two then he's yelling roll 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 he's cheating roll tells the mic he's leaving and then we would go we had one year where we didn't bring these guys at all because again we had athletic backers we had these guys were fast so in third down and long, we could just run pick, axe, play games with these three, and let everybody drop. And what we did is we picked the more athletic of these two, and we ran a true um, kind of Tampa 2 look almost, but with two backers. So the mic would drop to the deep middle, deep half, deep half, and then he would have shallow middle, and we would do something like that because we were getting pressure with three against five. We were able to do that for one year, and then after that it was, <laughs> no, we had to bring somebody. So, um, again, we were able to play games and drop eight sometimes, especially in third down and long or prevent situations, stuff like that. Even though I hate prevent, everyone always like, oh, prevent, you mean prevent you from winning, stuff like that. If you're able to teach it right, it can work to your advantage. <clears throat> so, four-man pressures, I brought everybody at some point. I brought Cobra, Rover, Willie, Mike, Sam, uh, Fog, Snake. Again, I brought everybody in some way, shape, or form. Um, it's just, you know, I I wanted to reward these guys for playing coverage all the time. So I wanted to make sure that they had the opportunity to blitz. Granted, if he's not a very good blitzer, I'm not going to bring him all the time. However, if he's not a very good blitzer, but this isn't a very good offensive line, and these guys don't read safeties, I might bring him a little bit more just to see. So, again, four-man pressures. These guys had A, a gap and B gap. Would bring them C on occasion, but essentially I try to keep them A to B. Keep them inside, keep them where they're comfortable. Same thing here. Keep these guys on the edge, D, C, maybe a little bit of B, but very rarely did I bring them into the A. Every now and then did I? Of course I did. Um, especially like if I want to run an out, um, an out soar. Um, sorry about that. If I want to run like an out soar, a 55 or even a 44, this one, again, these guys loved when we were able to run it. They would go out hard, and these guys would loop right into the A gap, and the nose would just set his hands. Again, something you can play with. We would call that out sore. And we would bring, depending on the coverage, depending on the, uh, the uh, formation, we tended to run man out of this just because I didn't like running cover three out of it too many holes, especially with the flat. So I liked to go man out of this. So now we would bring a safety down and we would run man free. But again, very rarely, they did love it. They enjoyed it, they had fun with it. Again, that's one thing about blitzing is that you can have a lot of fun with it. I'm a fan of putting pressure on the offense as a former offensive player. I hated blitzers. I hated having to study blitzers, especially when you have someone in that would like game plan. So how I did my blitzes is I planned one first and second down blitz. So like one blitz for first and second down on either side. So it's like, okay, we're gonna bring, you know, a slant storm and we're gonna bring an angle rover. Or technically what I would call this is we would slant to the tight end, bring a rover, we would angle Sam away from the tight end. So that's gonna be my first and second down blitz. My third down blitz is gonna be could my, it could be that lasso play where I'm bringing him through and him around. Then the next game I designed two new ones based on the coverage, based on the formations, based on what I get. So by, by game 10, the team we're playing, when they're looking at our film, they're looking at those last two games, they might not see that blitz from game one and I might bring that back. So by the time we get to game 10, I got 20 blitzes and they might only see you know three to five of them from the previous two games films. So works out really nice on that front when you're able to build like that and then plus two now you're kind of teaching something new it keeps the practices fresh it keeps your guys engaged and you're not overloading them you're like hey guys look we're focusing on this one and this one and if we can't beat them with these two we don't deserve to win we're going to execute the hell out of these two blitzes and these coverages and we're going to whoop their butt so that's what we're going to do so that's how i tended to teach defense and that's how i enjoy teaching defense that way and it worked. Again, you know, I'm a blitzer. It's gambling. You live and die by the blitz. And I lived really well, and I died a lot. But, it, you know, that just tends to happen when you're a gambler like that. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, again, four-man pressures. 
Again, just single guys, five man pressures. We have blast. That primarily brought these guys, my two interiors. Anytime again, like I said, if I did five man, it was primarily um, white for man free for us. And if I brought six, then that's <laughs> that's zero. Um, arrow. Um, that was that one where we're coming off on that. Um, crash, twists, um, war, Rover and Will, Mike, or Mask was Mike and Sam. Twist was Sam and Rover. So if I wanted to bring this, I would call it Twist. That's the Sam and Rover. I know some of you are like, well, wait, why aren't they twisting? It was just kind of made it easy for me. If I called out Twist, that's how I easily just got that, that look. Um, where I switched them. Again, it was just what the kids could remember and what the students could understand. That's how I kind of predicated how we built this. And to be quite honest, how I called it, I talked to the mic back, I was like, how do you want me to signal it? So he came up with the idea of, okay, hey coach, when you got the wristband, I want you to give me, you know, arm, belt, chest, and then, you know, dice. So he's like, that's a one, that's two, that's a three, that's a four, five, and then six. And then we came up with seven, eight, nine, and ten, just little hand signals and crap like that. So, but I let him design it because he was the guy who was calling the defense. So if he understands the calls, he's the one who teaches me the calls. He's gonna automatically know what I want and what I mean. Um, obviously, if there was ever a time I said, hey, you know, if they're doing hurry up, you know, let's keep it base cover three, depending on what they're doing. If it's a two, if it's a two minute drill and we're up, base cover three it, and just rotate who blitzes based on formation and based on field and boundary, and we would rep that. So again, just things we can do to kind of, you know, eliminate the thinking. Special pressures, um, the lasso, you know, where we bring the rover off the edge and then quick through the A and will through the B gap. So um, again, that's where we would kind of bring, you know, here, there, and there, and then we could twist that and things of that nature. Um, sometimes we would bring, again, we could bring the Cobra off. We tended to do that into the boundary. Um, very rarely did I do it to the field. Granted, I did just as a tendency breaker, um, especially say for example, if the hash, if that receiver lined up on the hash, I would bring that Cobra from the edge because that's not as far as if he's outside the hash, splitting the hash in numbers or on or outside the numbers, which some people would do to kind of obviously create spacing. So depending on where he lined up, determined on if I was gonna bring a field corner or not. So that kind of determined that. Um, and again, just adding little things. So like our lasso, rover would come off the edge, the quick would go to the A gap, and the will would come through the B gap. That was just our really quick, you know, and again, and we would run man out of that um, and things of that nature for that. So um, one special pressure I did like to run into the boundary, I call it maniac, and you're gonna kind of see why. Um, it was a it was a corner blitz, but it was also bringing a rover as well. So from the boundary, again, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming hard off the edge, okay. And then my rover is pinching through B into the A, okay. And then my quick is coming back to help basically play catch up as the corner comes off the edge rovers going through quick comes late to play cleanup so that's kind of what I call maniac and again the strong safety would come down or the free safety would come down strong safety would sit back and we would be in man coverage so uh, I called it maniac just um, to be quite honest C maniac with a C it was just something that kind of helped everybody remember it don't ask me you know the kids understood it they ran with it they enjoyed it so um, and then finally I would bring a, uh, a, a dog's blitz, which again was basically a six man pressure and kind of depending on which one of these guys I kind of trusted, but essentially he was, my stud was, or my sandbacker was to go all the way into the A gap. My, uh, stud was supposed to go all the way into C or sorry, he was supposed to go all the way into B, he was outside of D, and then my mic was coming through the C gap. And then he usually did not blitz. He came, he went filled the A gap, and then we came hard off the edge. That was a pre one of our six man pressures. I called it dogs. Dog strong, 
dog's weak. So if I wanted to flip it, I would just like dog's weak. Dog strong, dog's weak. Again, making it simple, little tags, and everybody knew dogs meant we're bringing six. Um, I think I did have a, uh, a nuke at one point. Um, I think I used it once, and it was like for um, so, uh, spread team that sometimes would line up, get under center, and go. Uh, but I think nuke ended up where these guys walked up um, into the B gap, basically. And then these guys, like my, my Mike and my Will, would walk up, head up the, or head up the guards. And then everyone was just coming. So he was coming hard, he was off. He was running through, running through, running through, running through, running through, and obviously we're in black, we're bringing seven. I think I ran that one time. And then I probably never ran it again because there was never any point to it. But again, that was a design blitz because of what the offense tended to do. So, um, and again, I only ran it once because I only needed to run it once and uh, it kind of became obsolete after that. So, just little things like that. Uh, one I did, <laughs> this one I enjoyed a lot. Um, and again, it all depends on your personnel. It really does depend on your personnel. Um, this one I called Hogs. So, um, because it was an homage to these two guys who were, again, really fast, really athletic. Hey, let's let them drop. And we had a team that loved to run running back screens and quick screens. And all so I was like, okay, well, fine. Well, let's run Hogs. Let's bring this out. So, what we did is basically the Mike and Will had a two-way go against the guards. They would come through in a two-way go, a two-way go. Um, essentially, if it was the strong side, um, I would tell the Mike to tell the nose where to go. And then depending on where the nose was going, that told the Will where to go. So if the Mike, if there was, this was the strong side and the Mike wanted him to go right, then essentially it would be something like that. Kind of became that scenario. So we would have these three. We'd bring these two hard off the edge. So right now we're bringing five. These guys would step hard into the tackles to basically hold them up. So that way these guys have a chance to come off and these Mike and Wills are playing one-on-ones and then they are dropping five to six yards and looking for the backs and looking for any kind of bubbles. Again, ran it in one game, like two times. Actually, no, three times. Two times it worked. One time we got burned because we missed a line and they came out and they ran a bubble and he didn't get out fast enough and we got burned. Um, one time we got a sack in the back because they didn't realize what we were doing. Second time it was a QB draw and we got him right at the line of scrimmage. He might've got a yard. So again, something fun. These guys enjoyed it and I had the athletes to do it. So if I have the athletes, I'll design it. I'll let them have some fun and they got to pick the name of it. So, um, one last thing I want to go over, so that was kind of my more exotic blitzes. Um, cover seven. Cover seven, cover seven, cover seven. So how this worked, it was from the 20 to about the five. After the five, you kind of have to go man. Um, but the idea is you're dropping seven into coverage, but they're building a wall and they're bracketing. So how that would work, and usually we brought the mic primarily on this. So everyone would be basically five to six yards straight across. So nobody knew who was doing what. So when they saw this, it was kind of, wait, are they doing cover two, cover three? What the hell are they doing? So everybody is basically um, even, to be as honest as brutally possible on this. And then again, our free safety would fill basically for the mic to some degree. So we would have eight across the board, but we're only dropping seven, okay? So depending on how these guys line up kind of determine what we were doing. So let's just say, for lack of a better word, there's these two guys, strong safeties here, rovers splitting the difference. They are bracketing these two. Corners drop directly to the pylon. And then let's just say that tight end's right there. Sam's outside the tight end. Free safety is dropping directly to the goalpost. So it's kind of like a cover three premise. But again, the idea is if he tries to go outside, strong safety hits him. And they're shuffling. They're square to the line of scrimmage. They're not turning their hips. As soon as they turn their hips, 
that allows for open lanes. So it's a really hard coverage to teach. I saw USC run it. Um, we were running it, and then we were just kind of looking at it. Like, hey, look, there's USC. They're running cover seven. Or at least what we call cover seven. I have no idea what they called it. But we called it cover seven because it was seven people in coverage. And so in this, okay, our, stud, our Sam and our Will are bracketing the Y. So as soon as that Y comes up, stud has to hit him. If he goes inside, he's yelling in, 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 in to alert the Will to slide because the Will's going to slide right to the middle as that free safety drops so he can pick him up. If they're in a spread, now here's where it got a little tricky for us. Okay, If they came out in a spread look, then what we would do is obviously we would adjust who's blitzing. Because now we want that Sam out here, we want our Mike uh, more in that arena, our free safety is inside and our Will's right there. So now, again, we can adjust, but we just kind of move him over. And again, our free safety's dropping, and our Mike and our Sam are now bracketing the number two. So they're bracketing, they're bracketing. And then our will is free to blitz or blitz engage on the ace back. So if he takes off, again, we're going to rally. That's fine. And he's there to blitz and play games. So we're always bringing somebody. It's just a matter of who. Now, of course, if you get to trips, we can also make the adjustment again. So let's just say they give us a trips look out of this. We can adjust everything and we can bring, and let's just say we, we just slide everybody over. I know some of you are going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going to slide your Sam way out there? We did. And did it work? Sometimes it did. Sometimes it did. But we would just slide everybody out. So that would be our, our stud. And then, again, now granted, now granted, we would slide some things and we would move our strong safety around. So our strong safety would be here. Stud would be there. There would be our Mike, free safety, Will, and Rover. Now, out of this... Again, it would make more sense. We would bring our will again. Again, drop into the pylon. Rover could play games. He could line up out here to prevent any kind of slant, which he did from time to time. And then he would disco tech and everything else. But he would go, again, back to the pylon. These two, these three are bracketing these two. So he comes up, he cuts inside. Mike hits him, passes him off to the will, unless he's blitzing. If he's not blitzing, then he passes him off to the will. If the rover is blitzing, blitz engage here. So, and then same thing, if he's coming inside, goes outside, strong safety takes him. So our strong safety would adjust to the strength of the formation, so in that way our Sam and our Mike didn't always have to go all the way outside. Did we on occasion move him out there? We did in the beginning, but then we're like, wait, let's make our strong safety be the adjuster. So in that way, again, we want to keep our inside backers inside. So that's what we tried to do. So that's our cover seven, it's building a wall, bracketing, shuffling, and staying square, and attacking that front, um, and forcing them and funneling everything. So again, you don't get it, it's a deep, uh, it's a cover three premise, and we're shuffling and bracketing. Nobody turns their shoulders. When we didn't turn our shoulders, we did really well. When we turned our shoulders, we were giving up slants. So again, when we stayed square, it worked really well. And again, it works good from about the 20 to the five. And to be quite honest, I think we kind of shortened that up even more where we did it like as a 10 yard coverage from 15 to the five. Just because even from the 20, there's a lot of area to give up. So I think from the 15 to the five, we give it that kind of 10 yard cushion. And then once we got to the five, we're like, okay, we're going cover one, we're going cover zero, let's go. So again, that's cover seven. Um, thank you guys so very much. I hope everyone is doing really well. I hope everyone's healthy. Um, next Tuesday, probably be the last uh, piece to the to the COVID um, series that I did on the head coaching thing in the season two. Um, probably getting close to the end of season two um, as far as my second season as a head coach. Um, I'll give you my review and I'll tell you what I'm moving on to next. Um, again, as always, thank you for the love and the comments. Type anything down below if you want me to cover something more in depth. Um, be great. Push limits. Hold the line. Have a great day.